Hi, Dr. Bush and Dr. Schnockgrass here at the Hypospadia Specialty Center, and today we have a patient with a fistula. We thought we'd take you through our decision making on this. So you can see his fistula there at the corona, and just at first glance, you see this tissue that's here distal to it up to the meatus. And the question is, can we just primarily close this or do we need to reopen the whole wound? And we make that decision based on the gland's wings, whether they're fused or not. So if you don't put tension on this, you let it down, you know, it, it looks less obvious that, that that's a gland's dehiscence. But if you put the sound in, you can see through the jelly uh, that in fact the gland's wings are here and here. So this is a fistula, but it's really a gland's dehiscence. With just a skin bridge, a skin not bridge. a true gland's closure right in this region. So we know that many of you looking at this wouldn't even hesitate and would say, well, of course you need to redo that repair. But in cases where the gland's wings are in fact better fused with that same fistula, then, then we've published, we could just close that with a success rate well over 90%. So the other thing we thought we would show this to you for is just about redo tips because that's probably what we're going to do here. And I, we know from reading operative reports that many of you would think well, you need to do a flip flap for this. And I don't know why, and yet that we read that from some surgeons around the country. So we're just gonna show you the steps of a redo tip are the same as the steps of a primary tip. So she's marking the median right face. She's going to mark the gland's wings in a second. And we, as always, we mark it just on the visible border of them, not by any measurement or assessment, just right along the visible edge. I also like to mark the corona just because that makes it a little bit easier to make sure that we're getting them together evenly later on down the road. You see there is some glands here. So this or at least kind of thickened scar. Of yeah, some sort. so this came apart right where that fissure is. And, and and this is another thing. We have the operative report injection. And the and the doctor who fixed him decided to do a gap procedure. And again the question is why? So there wasn't a, a barrier layer put in there. There wasn't good glands closure with that procedure because glands wings are not really developed extensively in that operation. So we think it's much better if people will just do distal tips and focus on doing it right Open this first to see better, or are you? Uh, personally, I like to cut the gland's wings and then cut off the. I mean, you can do either one. But we know that's what we're going to do, so. So as always, our cut is just through the epithelium. We'll develop it deeper with scissors. The other hand. Notice that we're not degloving circumferentially. We also see that in a number of operative reports that we read that again I think many surgeons just walk in see a penis and think it needs to be completely degloved and, and we just never deglove in redo surgeries like this. There's nothing we need to do on the dorsal side. We're also going to save the dartos here that we can, so we can use that as a barrier flap in a little while. 
and notice that we do this dissection without a catheter in the urethra. It's okay if you put one in, but you don't need to. So this is very similar to how we repair an MIP form of hypospadias in a child who had a newborn circumcision. That's true, it's exactly the same thing. We make a ventral incision and free things up and do a tip repair. So we'll get the same sutures ready that we would just for a primary tip repair, we'll want a six French catheter, we'll want our 9-0 ovipril, our 7-0 ovipril, and our 6-0 ovipril. So another thing that I'll mention while we're just opening the skin and everything here, that I wasn't taught, but boy we have learned, and that is that many boys who present with a fistula or a dehiscence or other complications have persistent or recurrent ventral curvature. That's less often, obviously, in boys who had a distal repair done, but it still happens. And so we now know to always check for curvature. And we usually do that before we cut the gland's wings. In this case, I uh, saw him with an erection before we started, and it looked straight. And we want to try to minimize the amount of skin that we're taking down in this region. So that's why we kind of had to extend our incisions up here to have enough working room. room. Yeah. So we can check that now. Erection. Actually, he's kind of giving us a natural one right this second. Yeah, there you go. Shows so that it's he's totally hard and totally straight. straight. Okay. But again, it's really important to take that moment and know that. Vesolute. So now we'll put a tourniquet on too, in addition to the injection, the epinephrine injection that we did, because it's really important to see the plane of dissection for glands wings very clearly. Particularly in a redo circumstance, where you're going to potentially encounter, you know, some scar tissue or just tissue planes that are not virgin in that yeah. regard. in other videos, we're going to dissect the glands wings up till the, the end of the urethral plate. 
that's our landmark. So we just want to be sure we're not getting real right. thin there. We don't want to be thin on the glands wing, so we have to have good substance to sew to. But we also don't want to get into the urethral plate. And that's why a redo can be harder than a primary because the planes may not be easily distinguished as they are in a primary. Same thing on this side. Make sure we're freed up here, which we look good. So we need to just get to the skin right mm -hmm. here and then reposition. Be careful here because there's just not much thickness on the plans wings. sure those wings are open nice and wide. There's still some tightness here and I think it's just where the skin is real tethered in this area. So remember this patient had a dehiscence and we need to really make sure that we're not leaving any tension on the gland's wings when we redo this so that it doesn't happen again. Let's cut that down. Mm -hmm. Now we can feel the glands wings better. I think just one iota right here. Yep, you can see that release, and you've got something. It really feels like it's in the skin we might here. Need to this one. We might need to, but I think we could go ahead and um, we we can um, do this before we take that off right there. There's a little band of yeah, scar. So that was just a skin issue that was up and down here creating tension on the gland's wings that's now better in that regard. Let's do one more. Right there. It's just so important to feel and, and tension bands as she just said can run from all the way down here up to the glands and cause glands dehiscence to occur. So you just need to take a moment and really check for all of that. And now we're going to incise your urethral plate. That wasn't done the first time. Doesn't matter. Even if it has been done, you can do it again at least one time. So at least the surgeon who did this followed the directions that you shouldn't do a gap unless you have a really deep plate. And so as a consequence, there's not much to do, but do you see the release that we just got? I mean, the corpora right here, so we're not getting as much of a change in the urethral plate, but you saw that release of tension 
in it, and that's important. And I need to pick up on my seven. And we always carry that incision into the meal. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So there's your seven. Yeah. Okay. There is plates, six French. It's plates in size. Absolutely no tension on those gland swings, no tension on any of this closure. And that feels nice and free as well. So we use, in this case, a six for inch. His gland's width was 14 at the beginning of the case, so this is an appropriate size stent. When it's 13 or less, we go down to a 5 French feeding tube. And again, we emphasize that the size of the neo-urethra is bigger than the size of our catheter. The catheter is not there to make a form for the urethra or to size the urethra. It's just there to drain urine. And a 6 French or a 5 French is big enough in a young child for that. What you for sure don't want to do is use stents that are larger that create tension on your closure. Yeah, like a 10 French, for example. We never, ever use a 10 French catheter uh, in a prepubertal kid. Oh, and by the way, we don't use it in postpubertal kids either. We so don't we use just an don't use 8 French for even for that. that matter. Okay. So now we need to look at this and see if we have anything to trim. I think that that skin bridge just kind of sucked itself back in. It doesn't look like yeah. it's really going to cause any trouble. So yeah. I think we're it's like in really nice shape. Point. But that's going to be below our suture. Mm -hmm. So let's just mark it again like we do for a primary tip, just to emphasize again where do these stitches go. Tighten that back up for a moment. We're just going to put this back on so that you can see more clearly. So our corona we have marked here. Here's our cut edge right here. So that's the distal end of the urethral plate. And, and then our, our first mark on the glands is going to go directly in the middle of that. And that's also where we're going to come across for our first urethroplasty stitch. Just exactly parallel with that. Mark here, mark here. Those are our landmarks. Right in the middle there and directly opposite that there. So this works as long as you carry the incision up uh, to the end of the urethral plate. I just to show incision. you one more time there. And this mark should be at least three millimeters away from your cut edge of your gland swings. So the, as in just a routine tip, distal primary tip. The first stitch is epithelial. To make sure we have a good solid closure. And I will say yet again that the neo or the opening in this, it's not the meatus, the opening in the urethral plate needs to be oval and not round so that you haven't sewn it too far distally. That would be a technical error resulting in meatal stenosis potentially. We're using 7O Vicro and a TG140 needle. And now we'll continue this with a running subepithelial stitch.
the tissues felt less elastic or we had concern about that, then we would do this with interrupted subepithelial stitches. Considering this urethra plate's never been incised and didn't heal with any scar tissue in it, it all the tissues feel just like a, a virgin, a virgin case. case would. And again, you don't need to worry about adding flat tissue to this. And when you do a flap and a redo, you're using skin that's been previously operated and that's been published to be less healthy and that you runs the risk of creating a ventral skin deficiency which then adds tension and might result in glands dehiscence again. Or another fissure and we have seen all of that. So these decisions that we make are important. I'm kind of tightened it just a little. And that's why we wanted to show this case and how we're doing this. Just like in a primary tip, we'll run this down, run it back, pressurize it to be sure that we don't have any areas of leaks, which is especially important in a redo where, you know, it, it's possible to have an inadvertent injury somewhere along your dissection plane because this is all reoperative tissue. So many, many years ago, I published that you can do redo tips in these circumstances and that there wasn't a different in outcome in magpies and tip, redo tips, I, I'm sorry, when the original surgery was a magpie or a tip versus those where it was an onlay flap or a matu, meaning that a prior incision of the urethral plate didn't preclude incising it again. And, and that was with an average of really one prior surgery. If you've had already, if this patient was to dehiss again, for example, then we would be thinking of an alternative repair. For example, if we could still do a urethral plate tubularization, but we needed to incise again, then we would likely inlay graft that. It is the only time we inlay graft is in a redo scenario or with a, a structure. Right. That's right. We don't primarily inlay graft. Just trying to get just the right amount on that needle. Yeah, the needle's getting dull. really become a mantra for us to to say 
we all need to get the first operation right. And I quit doing gap repairs when every single one I did, dehister had a fistula. Because if I understood the description correctly, you just, you, you know, made kind of a U-shaped incision and didn't really make glands wings in the formal way. And I just quit doing that because I, I don't see the point when you can develop glands wings, make a ventral um, dartos flap, cover the suture line, do a tip repair. Now how much incision you need if you have a very deep plate, that's a different story. You don't need much or really any if it's all the way down to the surface of the corpora. We don't hesitate to go ahead and cut that sun like in this case. You saw how it released tension in the plate. But it's just a more reliable repair and we really don't need to go back to the days of when I trained where you had to pick a different operation for every patient that had a distal hypospadias depending on what you perceived to be the anatomy. And I think had we done a tip repair on this patient in the first place or had his original surgeon done, he very well would not be here today having this reoperation. Okay, so now we need to, that's the urethroplasty we're going to check as she said. We started doing this several years ago now. And it sometimes it surprises you that you have a leak. Not this time. Okay, that looks fine. So now we'll raise a, we can take this off. Mm -hmm. we'll take off his tourniquet now that we've done all the work in the glands where everyone can see clearly. And we saved this ventral dartos right here as we started the operation. She's going to release that down there. Yeah. We just almost never do dorsal dartos flaps anymore because if you begin the operation as we did, saving the dartos. Maybe run down? Yeah. I thought I saw a vessel right here a second ago. save it at the beginning of the operation, then at this step, there's almost always enough without having to go dorsally. And, and in this case, uh, that's, again, a reason we don't need to deglove completely, because we don't need the dark test from up there. I like to hold it straight up in the air because you can see these tension bands that aren't connected to the underlying urethra. And relax just enough of it yeah, to get a perfect. tension free. So you see there's no tension on that at all, nine of black one. And it's just so quick to harvest that ventral dartos even in a redo like this. <coughs> and you're not disturbing all of his tissues with a degloving incision. That's particularly important in a patient like this because, man, the original surgeon did not leave one millimeter of extra skin 
fact, if anything, the skin looks too short on this ventral surface. As I said, for, for redo cases, we just don't often do a dorsal deep loving. We just it's not common that it's necessary to do that. And in some cases it can be detrimental, particularly when there is some skin deficiency. You can deep love and then find you can't quite get all that skin back again. Patient picked a yeah, nice time to get the hiccups. hiccups. Nice. Uh, it would have been a lot worse about five minutes ago, so right here. Which actually it was pretty polite of him if he had to get them to get them right now. It's just so annoying. <laughs> It is as though hypospadia surgery isn't hard enough. Then the patient decides to have hiccups as we're putting in fine little sutures. I, I totally agree. It's all the more challenging. Yeah. Done. Well, that's what I needed. Mm -hmm. So now we'll do the glands closure. And remember she made those marks earlier. We can still see them. We'll refresh them. Marking pen. Do we need to? Yeah, we need to. Mm -hmm. To remind people. Okay. It's always such a pain it. to mark when things are wet of any sort. So we have to totally dry things up. It's all right. So remember we have the corona marked. We have the end of the glands wing marked and then a point in between. Th this is just a good exercise. She started doing this when we were at the university because she often worked with junior level trainees and she wanted to emphasize exactly where to put it. I, I, I didn't do that, but when we started working together, I thought, well, that's not a bad idea, uh, Nino. And so now the very first stitch we're gonna put in epithelially just to make sure that we have the glands wings correctly aligned and symmetric before we start putting in the real gland stitches. Okay. I'm not, I don't what? think they can. Um, I don't think they'll be able to see. To time my stitch with his hip up. We have almost zero meatal stenosis, less than a half percent. 
And so we can say from that, not that we're fabulously unique surgeons, but that it's an avoidable complication in most cases. So for those of you who are having a greater problem with glands dehiscence, it's almost certainly something that you can change and diminish. And we've said that amongst the problems are rolling the plate too far or closing the glands here too tight or too far distally. Yeah, I was going to say, I think closing that neourethra too far distally or closing the glands too far distally is, I mean, you can't really get a worse problem in distal hypospadias than true meatal stenosis because that requires a two-stage repair to fix. So anything and everything you can do to avoid that I think is really critical. I think we're going to have to, since we've brought up the subject, we're going to have to define meatal stenosis because it's not the same to everybody listening. Some people just look at the urethromeatus and say, oh, that looks small, and then say to the parents, what's your stream look like? And they say, oh, it looks a little fine, doctor. And then they go, oh, yeah, it's got some stenosis there, and then they do a meatotomy or a dilation or something, and particularly in the first few months after surgery, that's just edema of the neo-urethra from the surgery, we define meatal stenosis as straining to void and a urethra that calibrates less than a fringe. So that's different. And when you use those parameters, it's not very many boys who develop that. Well, and you shouldn't be treating an asymptomatic boy who's opening just happens to look small to your eyeballs yeah. and unfortunately we see that all the time and we really think the wrong thing to do in the circumstances to have the families dilate these poor children it just isn't necessary and, and especially in an older kid can create all sorts of trauma psychological trauma, psychological trauma. So you notice that this is the second bite. And this is being done with a 6-0 Vipro. And you notice that I caught a little bit of the Darta's flap on that stitch to just hold it up into place so that it doesn't push its way out as we close the gland's wings over it. And so our typical glansplasty in almost every case is three stitches exactly as you're seeing here. The last stitch goes right at the corona. And this is, this is the glands closure. We do not put epithelial stitches in, haven't for almost 20 years. And our glands dehiscence rate in distal hypospadias is 2%. You gotta keep a little tiny bit of skin there. Nice little bit. Yep, perfect. And so you, we can say, based on that data, that you don't need epithelial stitches aesthetically or functionally to reduce glands dehiscence. And the problem with putting epithelial stitches in is that you get marks on the glands from it. And if this gland is already dehissed once, if it dehisses again and we've put epithelial stitches in, then there's a greater likelihood that stitches will cu make cuts. Cross hatches. Yeah. It's like a big train track across the glands. Or even a small train track. It doesn't matter. It's, it's ugly. It's really ugly. 
So there his gland is put together. Let's just show that for a second. I was going to put a okay. nine there just yeah, to okay. help do that. that last little bit together. Nine ovicrum. So right at the mucosal collar, at the very Sorry. end of the skin closure up here, we put a nine ovicrum epithelial stitch because usually especially in primary surgery the tissue is just too thin to really hold a sub epithelial stitch and a 90 if it makes a suture track it's going to be so small that you're probably not going to see it it's so hard to see against a blue background but if we put a white background then it's hard for y'all to see so in every case when we're done just for our own data collection we measure what we call the glands fusion distance which is the the distance from the ventral lip of the meatus to the corona I lift it up for them to see yeah. it so we know where the distal lip is because we put a stitch there. Right there. Right there. And there's our next stitch. Those are our landmarks. So that's four. Four millimeters, which is exactly in the normal range. And that's by far the most common measurement that we get. Now I'm just feeling along here because the skin feels tight. It's not tight on this side. You can see there's some laxity, but right here you can see that it just, it doesn't move. It's not as free. So something has kind of scarred in here or is tethered in some way, shape or form. And we want to see if we can figure out what that is. Let's have one to a thousand. We can stop this little bit of glands ooze so that we can show you. So again, what causes dehiscence? Well, the things that we can control include tension because the gland's wings weren't freed enough or because there's skin tension. You can see that bit of skin tension on that side that you just don't see over here. I don't know if you can appreciate that band, but you definitely don't see that same sort of band on that side and you clearly can see it on this side. And this sort of band can create tension going all the way up to, it's going right here. And that could, in theory, put some tension on that wound right there. So who knows if this contributed at all to his original issue. But it's certainly something that, in this circumstance, we want to get rid of. So how do we do that? Well, we have two ways. One, we could just open this up and then cut this little bit of thickened scar tissue off. This, you can just see that band. You can cut that right off because that will all go together midline. Some people I know prefer to make an incision and do a Heineke Michelitz maneuver here and bring things together. That wouldn't be wrong either. Um, but my concern with doing that is that you would make this a little bit too tight. There's no extra skin down there in, in that regard. So that's why we're going to just go right down the middle here. And it's better to have a longer incision than to have any tension somewhere on your wound that's avoidable. Well, it's going to close back and in the And here is part of the problem, is, is this band right here that we can just go ahead and, and release. And it, it really does go all the way down to here. There we go. That just helped free that up quite a bit. We'll make them symmetric. Now the yeah, other look thing, how, look, look, show, show them how lax that is now compared to how it was just a moment ago. I mean, there you just don't see that same tension. You, you see it just a little bit right here. There's the, the rest of that band. 
And so the way we're going to approach that is just to make a little incision. Do you see how his... Yeah, just lengthen. Well, I don't know. You can't see it on the... Um, unfortunately, it, it didn't capture it, but it... it My hand it, moved. It moved dramatically down towards his ankles because all of that was released just by releasing this little bit of tethered tissue right up here. And we still have just a little bit of it that we can see right along this area. So watch this hand. I know I'm doing the cutting, but if you watch that hand, you're going to see that it's going to drop down yeah. from that incision. And that just relaxes that tissue there. Now the other thing we want to do, so we've, we've cut that to try to remove any tension. We're going to go ahead and free the dartos up back here as well to finish removing tension on tissues. And then we're also going to, um, I guess, transmit some of the any downward tension from this heavy scrotum to a suture right here and right here so that it pulls here and here and not anywhere along this ventral skin that could t um, potentially take our glands apart again. I mean, this is a high risk scenario that's already had dehiscence once, and we want to do everything we can in this. Um, circumstance to avoid it again because you may never get it together. So in this circumstance we're doing these scrotoplasty sutures because this skin is just still kind of snug and we want to be sure we're doing everything possible to get rid of any potential tension. It's not quite deep enough to the corpora there. Many of you do this stitch in proximal repairs to keep the penis from telescoping back into the body. But we found that it's very helpful in a variety of circumstances in addition to that, such as this case, to try to add another layer of protection against downward tension. And also in cases where there is ventral skin deficiency in boys with penile curvature, because when you straighten their penis with ventral lengthening, as we do for a curvature more than 30 degrees, then the ventral skin deficiency becomes even more, and they need to have nice, symmetric, supple, elastic, circumferential penile skin to have a normal penis. And we've been amazed that putting these stitches in, when we do a stack repair, results in the natural erection stretching that skin and boys who were born with no ventral skin we move the skin under there and we see them back in six months and, and they look like a normal penis it's a truly amazing thing but if you don't put these stitches here the natural erections they don't, don't stretch, they don't the, stretch skin. the skin. Instead, it's much easier to take this lax skin and just pull it all up. So you actually contribute to that persistent look of penoscrotal transposition and having scrotal hair along the ventral surface, which is never a good look, I don't think, for anyone. These are pointers that we've learned, and you can, of course, watch our stack video to see in more detail what we're referring to. So we'll be able to trim just a little bit more of this tissue right here. You can pick a side, but since this side is so much more relaxed than this side, I'm going to go ahead, and that's why I put this suture here, because again, it allows you to see what tissue is extra and if there are any thickened areas of dartos or tension bands. So we've got extra skin that we can remove. We've got this thickened tissue here and you'll notice that this is going to drop down just a couple millimeters as we cut this, most likely. Yeah. Should it, it struck me as she was doing that to say many of you, some of you might have looked at this at the beginning of the case and thought 
you would have done this through the circumscribing and so through his circumcision and degloved him and done it that way. And if you had done that, you would not readily see this tension created by the skin here because it drops down and then you just lift it, sleeve it back up. And again, there's no reason to dissect on the dorsal side of this penis or most penises during redo surgery. So we, this has been our standard approach for over 20 years. I still don't like this little bit of tension that I see. I'm gonna make just a tiny relaxing incision right there. And now our skin is gonna be evened out so that you can see there's not that same pull that we had on that before. So Seven to do I all of that, you would have, if, if you degloved completely, you would then have to split to down do the middle. So you would have ended up with a much bigger incision than we've made for no gain. There's no gain by completely degloving in these cases. So we're making a, a, you know, a statement about that because it's an ingrained habit for many people. But it, it, it doesn't lead to optimal outcomes, particularly when you have asymmetry of the penile skin, which is very common in boys who are undergoing hypospadias reoperation for whatever reason. So now that we've done all that work, it should be relatively easy to just zip up the skin. And all of this is done in a nice aesthetic fashion that doesn't leave any new scars on this boy. I can't tell you how much I hate that square scar that people do when they do a flap repair or when they try to close a fistula and then Put a flap over it. Put a flap over it. It's just so hideous. And then, as in all skin closures, we do interrupted subepithelial seminovibral stitches. So I think we can stop this when you're ready. Yeah, I think this is a good time. I think y'all can. Imagine how it's all going to zip up and finish up. We'll use um, a Tegaderm bandage and 4x4s just like we do for any of our primary enclosures. We'll leave this catheter in this circumstance for a week and hopefully he doesn't have, have any problems. problems in terms of recurrent dehiscence or fistula. So thanks for joining us today. If you have any questions, you can always reach us at info, info at hypospadius.com.